the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, very familiar uh, chapter for many of us. There's a few verses there that we need to deal with for today, and I'll read them and try to preach them as best I can within the power and the ability that, uh, that God has, has given us. Let me say this so I won't have to do this later. If the ushers could, uh, I need a communion uh, cup and wafer. If you could uh, get that uh, to us before the start of um, the communion aspect of today. Also on the uh, printer, there should be a announcement if you would bring that uh, down as well. Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight and verse 26 through 28. When you get there, please say amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 28 through 28. Pray for us, if you would, please. Pray for us. In the same way, I talk about what that means, why Paul put that there. He's just not putting that there for nothing. In the same way, has significance. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. So by saying that, there's some previous help somewhere in the previous verses. We'll talk about that. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself, what does he do? He intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, there's some people who believe that Paul is talking about speaking in tongues, and this is not a passage that you want to use to support speaking in tongues because everybody is not given the gift of speaking in tongues, but everybody does have the Holy Spirit to intercede for them. So this is not one of those instances for speaking in tongues. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I may say this in the message, I may not, but if you come down to verse number 34, we really have double intercession. We have the Holy Spirit who's interceding for us, but according to verse 34, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who also does what? So we've got double intercession. We've got Jesus in heaven interceding, and we've got the Holy Spirit in our hearts interceding. Somebody ought to say amen. That ends the reading of this pericope. Let us pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for blessing us with an opportunity to share this message on today. May it be food for our souls. Help us to work through the text. Help us to make sure we focus on the things that you want us to focus on and say the things you want us to say. To the person who is saved, help us to challenge them to realize the resource that we have in the Holy Spirit. But then also help the sinner to know that he or she needs the Holy Spirit to make them alive. Instead of being dead, because Paul said in Ephesians chapter two, we are in we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But thanks be to God, he says later, for making us alive in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your love, Father. It is in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Today for this this first message, I want to talk about. And remember, we are in a new month, new theme, seeking God's guidance. And today we're seeking God for his victory. We're seeking God for his victory. We are seeking God for his victory. Give me just a second. Amen. We are seeking God for his victory. Evelyn... Tillerson was very well known in her church and her community. She was a dedicated 
uh, Christian and community worker, everyone, everyone knew, knew Evelyn. However, long before Evelyn was known for her dedication to Christ, for a dedication to a church, for dedication to serving in her community, Evelyn was known to many people as a drug addict. For 20 years, Evelyn was addicted to crack cocaine. For many years, she would get clean only to relapse to everyone's disappointment. But her life took a drastic turn on May the 15th, uh, 2015, when she met a woman from a local community church that specialized in helping people overcome addiction. Evelyn got in the program and overcame her addiction to drugs, and when people would see Evelyn, who knew her from her past, they would always tell her how much she had changed. And Evelyn was very quick to respond with her same saying, you know I live by 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. Like Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. Evelyn never grew tired of expressing her, her gratitude for God's grace in her life. And one of the ways that Evelyn demonstrated her gratitude for God's grace was that the same program that helped to save and deliver her, she went back to that program and started serving within it in helping other people who were addicted to drugs just like Evelyn was. To the extent that many people realize how much Evelyn was impacting people's lives within their community. Pastor got wind of it. Her pastor, Pastor Carson, honored Evelyn for her dedication to helping those who were addicted to drugs. One Sunday morning, to Evelyn's surprise, Pastor Carson invited her down front, and he had this plaque with her name on it, honoring her for her dedication and her service. You, you could have bought Evelyn for, for a nickel. It also, in addition to the plaque, he gave her a certificate to her favorite restaurant, Evelyn was all smiles as she soaked up the applause from the congregation. Everybody was clapping for her. However, as soon as church ended, Evelyn, Evelyn hurriedly left the sanctuary and headed for her car. Once she got in the car, she put her hands over her face and wept uncontrollably. On a day when people were honoring her for helping people to overcome their addiction to drugs, Evelyn couldn't stop thinking about Angela, her only daughter. Angela always told people that she would never repeat her mother's life of addiction. But lo and behold, that's what she was doing. One day a friend coaxed Angela into trying heroin and when Angela tried heroin for the first time, it never was her last time. Angela became a heroin addict. From the age of 19 to the age of 25, Evelyn tried to get her daughter within the program that helped to save her. But Angela would always tell her mother, I can quit whenever I get ready. As Evelyn thought about her daughter, the phone rang. Angela's name appeared on the phone. Evelyn smiled because she hadn't talked to her daughter in about three months. She was looking forward to talking to her. But as soon as she answered the phone, she realized something was different. She said, hello. And the voice on the other end said, may I speak with Ms. Tillerson? This is Ms. Tillerson. How may I help you? Ms. Tillerson. I'm Angela's best friend, and I want you to know that she just overdosed and died. Evelyn dropped the phone, grabbed the steering wheel, and screamed, No, no, not my baby! Not my baby! In the days leading up to Angela's funeral, Evelyn struggled to make it through each day. She went down into deep depression. From the time that she heard the news of Angela's death, she also struggled to pray. As much as she tried to pray, she just could not find the words. 
At the funeral, Pastor Carson shared kind words about Angela, but he also told the congregation that there are times in our lives when we are so overwhelmed that we won't even know how to pray. Carson, Pastor Carson added these words, we should be glad that when we don't know what to say, God has given us a valuable resource in the person of the Holy Spirit who helps us when we know we need to pray. I'd have to agree with Pastor Carson in his words to Evelyn and the family and the congregation. I know I've had some moments in my life when because of life circumstances, life circumstances were so overwhelming that I couldn't even pray. Please make sure you understand what I didn't say. I didn't say I didn't want to pray. I say I didn't know what to pray. Didn't know how to pray in those moments. I struggled with prayer because something was going on in my life. I know I love God. I commune with him each and every morning. Read a devotional. Study his word. But sometimes I've gone through problems in my life that all of my theological, Christian verbosity, academic intelligence does not do me any good. I can't find the words. In those moments, I'm thankful that God doesn't leave me alone. He gives me a resource that enables me to still be able to get what I need to get to God, my Heavenly Father. I imagine that some of you have been there before in your life and in your experience with God. I'm sure some of you may not want to admit it because your testimony to us today would be, I ain't never been there. I've always been able to pray. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. But if you were to be honest with us today, you'd probably be talking about how you too have had some moments in life when the burden was so heavy, when the load was weighing down on you, when you had sunk so deep into depression that you couldn't even find the right word to talk with God. And your testimony today is, I'm glad that God didn't leave me in my problem without a resource that would help me to communicate with the Father what I wanted him to know. This is what I'm glad about today. I'm glad that God doesn't leave us without resources in our problems. God blesses us with resources in our problems. If the Apostle Paul were here today, let me get through this as quick as I can. Paul would say, Trevor, you got a witness. And I know I'm right in my assertion because in Romans 8, 26 through 28, Paul helps us to understand that God doesn't leave us in our problems without resources. Paul helps us to understand that God in our problem blesses us with resources. When we look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 through 28, uh, in this context, we learn that Paul directed his focus on the reality of the believer's suffering and struggles in this present world. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, if we bag back up and catch the context, Paul said that as fellow heirs of Christ in this present world, we are going to suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. If you come down to verse 18, the next verse, Paul shares with us, no matter how much suffering you're going through, when you compare your suffering to the glory that is to come, there is no comparison. Then Paul keeps on talking, and he says in verse 19 to 23, there's a reason why you're suffering. He said, I got a good reason why you're suffering. The reason why you're suffering is because, I'm summing up these verses, you live in a corrupt world. This is, not, this is not the Garden of Eden and all of its perfection and the way that God created it before Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into this world. No, you live in a corrupt, sinful world that is longing and groaning for the day when it will be freed from its bondage and corruption to sin. And if you're wondering why you're suffering, you got a lot that can cause you to suffer. Naturally, natural disasters, folk who live in a sinful world 
who are also sinful. Sometimes it's not a natural disaster. Sometimes it's just that person that makes your life a living hell. That's why you suffer. And then Paul goes on to argue that even though we live in this fallen and corrupt world where we will suffer, God has given us some hope. God has given us a resource that enables us to pick our head up and have an expectation that things are going to get better. But wait a minute, Pastor, things haven't really gotten better in my life. That don't mean you can't hope that they get better. That there are some things that I hadn't seen change yet that I'm hoping that they get better. And hope becomes a resource because when you really think about hope, it is to look with an outstretched neck on those things that you are expecting to come. Do I have a witness here? When you were a child, you hoped for Santa Claus to come <laughs> until you learn better, maybe. And all that year, until, you know, from last year, December 25th, your neck was stretched out, <laughs> possibly hoping, and especially close it got to December the 25th for Santa Claus to come again. Well, there are some things that I got an outstretched neck for. And some things that I'm hoping for God to change that I haven't seen change yet. But that's a resource that God has given us. And then Paul goes into 26 through 28. And there is where we move into the text. And Paul helps us to understand that there's an additional resource that God has given us for when we don't have the right words to pray. What is it in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 through 28 that Paul teaches us about the resources that God has given us in the moment when we can't find the right words to pray. The first thing that Paul says that God gives us as a resource is the Holy Spirit. If you look there in verse 26, Paul says the Holy Spirit helps us when we're weak. Paul said in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. The words in the same way mean in the same way that hope is a resource that helps us in our suffering. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is also a resource who helps us. And Paul said he helps us in our weakness. Now, there are some who argue what this weakness is. I do know this. It's a weakness in regards to a lack of spiritual insight. I do know that for sure. Because in the context, when you think about it, the reason why we need the Holy Spirit is because within our human frailty, within our human limitations, we don't have the understanding, knowledge, and ability to, to discern like we really think we do. And because of that, we need the Holy Spirit to help us in our weakness. And the word helps. Now watch this. It's in the present tense. It means ongoing help. See, there are some of us who pray who think that there are moments when we're weak, we really don't know what to say, really don't know how to pray, and so therefore we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Help is constant because our weakness is not momentary. Our weakness is constant. You, me, we're always weak. We're always limited in our understanding. We're always limited in our knowledge. We're always limited in how far we can see and what we know. And so, therefore, I always, you always need the help of the Holy Spirit. I, I can hear somebody thinking right now, right out loud. I don't know about that, Pastor. I know I done prayed some prayers. I knew what I wanted to pray, and I knew how to pray. Don't fool yourself. You're not God. You're not the Holy Spirit. You don't know things that well. And we know you don't know things that well because you have made some mistakes in your decision making. We know that. Family members know that. Folk who know you well know that. And so therefore, don't pontificate this morning. Go on and be like the rest of us and admit that you are weak too. You too have limitations. And because of that, you too need the Holy Spirit in your moment of weakness, which is always. Second thing Paul says, you, you, you're going to need the Holy Spirit as a resource because he helps you in your weakness, but he helps you when you don't know what to say. If you look at the text, Paul said, 
for we don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Pastor, I thought you said we don't know what to pray. That verse says we don't know how to pray. Where does that come from? Well, New American Standard says we don't know how to pray. But when you read it from the New International Verse, and it doesn't say how, it says we don't know what we ought to pray. Now, one translation says we don't know how. One translation says we don't know what. Which one do we go with? I would say you can go with both of them if you want to. Because either way you look at it, there are times when we don't know what to pray, and there are times when we don't know how to pray. And please understand something very important. In those moments when we struggle with what and how, that's when the devil comes sliding up. And what the devil says is, since you don't know how to pray and since you don't know what to pray, why are you praying then? Why are you trying to pray when you don't know what to pray and you don't know how to pray? That's why we need to be thankful for the Holy Spirit. Because in those moments, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to slide up next to us. He's already in us. <laughs> Preach, man. And because he's in us, when the Holy Spirit, I mean, when the devil comes sliding up, talking foolishness like that, talking about you don't know how to pray, you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit says, I'm good with that because that's what I'm here for. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm here for. I know you don't know how to pray. I know you don't know what to pray, but that's what I'm here for. Because I can step in and communicate with the Father in a way that you don't know how and sometimes when you don't know what. How might I help you to understand this? One of our three grandsons was at the house one day. Cruz looked at me and he started telling me something I didn't understand. As much as I tried to discern what he was telling me, I couldn't understand it. He just kept telling me, like, no, Papa, I can't get it. You want what? And he say what he want. So his, his grand came around the corner. And she heard the conversation going on. And she said, Papa, this is what he's trying to tell you. He wants some cereal in a cup, just like you're eating, with some milk in it, and just like you have raisins in your cereal in your cup, that's what he want too. Got it for him. And I'm like, oh, man, that's what you were trying to tell me. He, he knew what he needed. He knew what he wanted, but I didn't. But once I found out, now I can get what he needs. There's... There's a little bit of point of difference here. I thank God that my wife was an intercessor and the Holy Spirit is an intercessor for us who helps to interpret what we're trying to say when we know what we need. But before you ever go to God, he already know what you need. But he still wants you to come to him and talk to him and tell him what you want. And when you tell him what you want, if you struggle with it, the Holy Spirit can interpret what you're trying to say, intercede, and make sure that it gets to the Father just like it needs to be. See, this is the third thing that I want to deposit in your spirit. I'm almost done. We need the Holy Spirit in our weakness, but we also need him when we don't know what to say. But then thirdly, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to discern God's will. Watch this. As I kept leaning into this text, I got happy. <laughs> I kept reading and I kept studying and I kept understanding in ways that I hadn't previously understood. And see, one of the reasons why my appreciation increased for this text, Paul says, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Whenever we pray, watch this. What are we to pray? According to the will of God. Well, guess what? You remember that weakness I talked about? That's always there. Since it's always there, we don't always know what God's will is. Yeah, but pastor, I read the Bible all the time and I know his word is his will. Yeah, I understand that. 
Sometimes you can read something in the scripture, say, for instance, like we read this morning, that God heals all diseases. That's God's word. You can flip that and say, that's God's will for my life. Pray for healing, and you don't get healed. All right. I guess y'all think I'm making this up. Let me see if I can help you with this. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 8, you're going to find that Paul said that he asked God as he prayed three times to remove a thorn in his flesh. What was God's will for Paul's life? Was it for the thorn to be removed? We know it wasn't because we read where Paul says, and God answered and told me. My grace. But see, if he's saying my grace, he's saying yes to grace, but he's saying no to what? He's saying no to Paul's request. Now, was Paul praying according to God's will? No. Because if he had to pray according to God's will, he would have prayed the same thing that God had as his will, which was not for Paul's thorn to be removed, but for Paul to keep the thorn and get his grace. And if that's the case, he gave Paul not what he wanted, but what he needed. And my word to you today is that's how come we need the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit can help us. To communicate to God what we need instead of what we want all the time. See, I imagine as Paul was praying, the Holy Spirit says to the Father, I know what Paul is asking for. He's asking for what he wants. But as the Holy Spirit intercedes, he says to the Father, don't give him what he wants. <laughs> give him what he needs. And I would look at you today. And unabashedly say to you, there are times when God has told you no. I don't care what you asked him for and a desire of a want. But he looked back and his response was, no, my child, I'm not giving you what you want. I'm going to give you what you need. And what you need in this moment is not for me to deliver you from what you're going through. I need you to go through that. And as you go through it, I'm going to give you my grace. See, I, I, I know he wants us to go through it. And that's the second thing that I want to pull out of this text and I'm done. The Holy Spirit is a resource. But then there's another resource in 28. What's the resource? God. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any sophisticated way to say it. God is the resource. What do you mean, Trevor? You look at Romans 8 and 28. Paul gave us another resource when he said, and we know <laughs> that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his what? To his purpose. Now, as I go into this, I have preached a whole sermon on Romans 8 and 28. So please forgive me if I don't spend the time that you think I ought to in Romans 8 and 28. I'm just taking a cursory look real quick at at least two things that, that jump out and say, hey, say something about me, and then I'm going I'm to move on. And the first thing that jumps out and says, say something about me, is the fact, first of all, that no matter what problems we may face, we need to understand that God is working in the midst of our problems. You may not be able to see God working, but you got to trust that he's working. You need to be encouraged today by that word because not only is God working, but he's working things out for your good. Is that not in the text? God is working things out for our good, and this means that God is in control of every circumstance. He's taking every situation good and bad, and working it out for our good. See, sometimes we want God to leave this out and just make that good. Leave this out, make that good. Take this out, make that good. But this word working, synergeo, means to work and, and things coming together. And so God is able to take that which you want to leave out, leave that in there, and still take the bad and the good and make it all good for your good. Preach trouble. 
see, see, the second thing that I want to I want to pull out of this that 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 says, hey, say something about me, is the fact that this this verse tells us that God is working. But not only is he working things out together for our good, but he's working things out because he's working according to the purpose for which we are called. The relevant question is, what is the ultimate purpose for which God has called us? Is it to make us rich? Is it so that we can get a big house and a garage full of cars? Is it because God wants to make us famous? Is it because God wants to lighten every one of our burdens? Why did God call us to salvation? If you read 8 and 29, that's your answer. Paul said that the ultimate purpose of God calling us to salvation was for none of those things that I just mentioned, but it was to conform us to the image of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is the mission of this church? To be conformed to the image of Christ and to help others be conformed to the same image. That's important because, as I said, people want to make this call to salvation, the ultimate purpose, something else, when God has something else in mind. If you're listening to me right now, you need to know that God has an ultimate purpose for your life. Young Christian, middle-aged Christian, older, senior Christian, God has an ultimate purpose for your life, and it is to make you more like Jesus Christ. John follows up Paul's words. First John 3 and 2, John said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, that's Jesus, we'll be like him because we're going to see him just as he is. That's the victory that we have in the Lord God and in the Lord God and his son and the work that he's done and his son and the work that he's doing through us. Nothing can stop God from working out this plan. I know that because when you look at 29, there's the word predestined. Don't ever attach that word to people who's going to hell. That word only is to be used with people who are going to heaven, who are children of God, that God has predestined to be conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word predestined means to mark out. It means a point. So in using this word predestined, Paul says there's a point that God knows that you're going to get to. Talk to me again. I don't care what you go through in life, failure, success. There's a place that God has marked out that he knows that you're going to make it to. And that is looking like the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Pastor, I keep messing up. You're going to get there. But Pastor, I fell down again. You're going to get there. But pastor, I said the wrong thing again. You're still going to get there. But pastor, I know that I called them out of time. No, you're still going to get there. Because there's a place that God has marked out. He says here, right here, is where you're going to get to. When you place your trust in the Lord, for that type of divine work in your life, there, there's nothing that can keep you from having hope, no matter what you're going through in life. When you place your hope in the Lord for that type of work to go on, on your best worst day, <laughs> on your best worst day, can I say it that way? On your best worst day, God is still working for the good. Do you believe that on today? See, some folk want to get through this life as a Christian and have no suffering. That's not the way it's going to work. If you want to look more like Jesus Christ, you're going to have to go through not the same thing he went through, but you're still going to have to suffer. And as you think about your suffering, your suffering will never equal nor be greater than that of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What do I mean by that? He was ridiculed, hadn't done nothing wrong. Falsely accused, hadn't done nothing wrong. We can relate to that. There may be some commonality there, but here's where there's a distinctive break. They whipped him 
all night long. They marched him up a hill called Calvary, laid him down, and put him on an old rugged cross, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, thorn on his head. Died he did on that, on that Friday. But thanks be to God, three days, three days, three days. In early Sunday morning, you see the Father, power at work. Bringing and lifting the son out of the grave to the point that he could come out and say all power. Heaven and earth is in my hand. And that same power is what's working in your life, is working in my life, in the midst of these problems that we're going through. I could just go right to Florida. Whole building collapse. Over 150 folk missing. Not even half have been accounted for. And you talk about having a bad day. Talk about having some problems. But even in the midst of problems like that and even more, God is still at work. And when you're at a loss for words, when you get that news, when you hear it, can't put the words together. Rely on the Holy Spirit to be your intercessor and your interpreter. I said a minute ago, I'm done. Amen. Typically, they would have been up here, but maybe they listening in a way this morning. They don't typically listen. Amen. Maybe the message has them. Amen. And, and they're grasped by the message. I'm just messing with these ladies. But uh, they're on their way up now. They're on their way up now. Close us out. The doors of the church are open. God does not leave us without resources in our problems. God blesses us with resources in our problems. I gave you two of those today. The Holy Spirit, God himself. And don't forget as the Holy Spirit is interceding, Jesus Christ is interceding. One in heaven and one in your heart. That's a double intercession. I know you can get through. With a double intercession. I know you can get through those problems you're going through with a double intercession like that. May God bless you. May God continue to be with you. You can come by letter, baptism, or Christian experience. If you go to trinitymvchurch.org, click on belonging. You can put one of those options in there, no matter where you are, no matter the distance. We would be glad to have you as a part of Trinity Missionary Baptist Church. May God continue to be with you. I'll be back shortly after the ladies have some.